at a town hall meeting to present his plans to the business community in Lagos on Tuesday. Bola Tinubu, presidential candidate of Nigeria's ruling party, the All Progressives Congress, APC, has said his administration will remove fuel subsidy, liberalize the petroleum sector, and target double-digit economic growth if elected into office next year. The APC presidential candidate and his team also answered different questions on the party's plans for different sectors of the economy, including insecurity and women inclusion in governance. Tinubu attended the event with his running mate, Kasim Shetima, former Bono State Governor, and several members of his campaign team, noted that the current subsidy arrangement in Nigeria favored certain sections of the population against the general interests of the society, stressing that it should be discontinued. Joining us now is Ulu Aruwolo Vejen and Asukwa Epeyong to discuss how the Tinubu Shetima economic plans will be implemented. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Yes, Vejen and also uh, Epeyong. Uh, Good, morning, Good to have you on the program. Thank First, I would like the two of you to take us through that manifesto. 80 pages long, it's titled uh, Renewed Hope uh, 2023. Uh, just, you know, to take us through it, you know, as uh, the background for our conversation around the key uh, highlights. Let me start with you, uh, Virgin. Um, thank you, um, and Olu is fine. Uh, Olu is fine. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, that manifesto is a blueprint for um, the key objectives of double-digit growth to lift um, millions of Nigeria out of poverty and restore confidence in our economy. There are different aspects of it um, that um, we can talk to, speak to. In my case, I can speak to the oil and gas um, um, aspects of the um, manifesto. And essentially, um, one of the things that is key if you want to achieve, I mean, the oil sector accounts for, the oil and gas sector accounts for less than 10% of the GDP, but accounts for 90% of foreign exchange earnings and about 60% of fiscal income. That sector needs quite a bit of um, um, improvements around energy, sec around security and addressing crude theft um, so that we can get back to double digits. Um, one of the things that um, the um, Katinubu Shetima team have um, outlined as their main objectives for the oil sector is to address insecurity and crude theft to restore um, the 800 and eight, over 800 barrels of production that is currently shutting and restore LNG capacity to about 60 percent. That's the first step. The next step, obviously, is to now address 800, about 800,000 barrels of 100. production that is uh, per day that is um, currently shut in due to those challenges. Um, to, so the first thing is to and, and implore, you know, enforce a framework, the, the existing security um, apparatus, and make improvements in areas that are required to ensure that we can bring that production back on stream. Because if you look at that, at current prices, that's about $2.4 billion a, a month that's, um, that we don't have access to. Um, so that's the first objective and the primary objective. When you do that, you restore confidence um, um, for investors and hopefully then attract more investments for growth in areas like NLNG Train 7 and more, um, and bringing your production back to about 4 million barrels per day by 2030, which is what's stated in the manifesto. Okay, um, Asukwe Payong, your take. Thank you very much, sir. Um, the Tinibu Shetima administration is um, looking to grow the economy by double digits. Um, and one of the greatest ways to do that is by strengthening the SME sector, small, medium enterprise. It will serve as a great catalyst to economic growth. The SMEs today in Nigeria account for 96% of businesses, um, contributes about 84% to employment, but just um, contributes 48% to the gross domestic product. Um, the, Chatima, the Tinubu Shatima administration will be focused on growing SMEs to strengthen and grow the economy. It would uh, address this by ensuring that there's adequately priced capital available to deserving SMEs. It would also work seriously to um, bridge the infrastructure gap, the deficit that exists, exists currently in the area of road transportation, rail transportation, ports. But beyond that, it would address aggressively the power problems to see how they can ramp up manufacturing and production locally in Nigeria. Beyond that, it would look to build capacity within the SME sector 
so that they can compete like for like with their counterparts outside the country. It will strengthen SMEs to be able to leverage and you know take opportunities in the 1.3 billion people market created by the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. It would look into um, the Smeden Act, review it, revise it if necessary to empower the institution to be able to carry out these reforms amongst many others. Okay, so two things. Let me come to you. Um, you want to ramp up production. A lot of people argue with you that crude oil turf is not only the problem. The wells are moribund. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you fix that? And the IOCs are not ready to spend money on them, which is the major investment you need. So how would you able to f will you be able to fix that in the first place? NNPC has also gone private Correct. here. Mm -hmm. And you know that comes with NNPC doing its own part that it's not doing. Correct. Is it still going to run the model of the president to be minister of petroleum thing and he oversees, but there's still loopholes everywhere? So let's talk about um, the IOC's exits. So IOC's exiting mature oil and gas provinces is nothing new in the energy sector. That's what happens all the time. They've been operating here since the 60s. Once your cost structure becomes too um, uncompetitive because of declining production, you exit to, more, to, lean, to independence with leaner in a cost structures. That happens all over the world and Nigeria is no exception. Yes, crude theft has accelerated that process and complicated it um, in many ways. And, but you see the IOCs exiting, not the country, but the onshore business. They are going offshore and they're staying in the gas business. So will you be able to, if you address the general insecurity, if you aggressively address the crude theft problem, and lower the carbon intensity of your production, you should be able to attract investments to independents who have much more leaner structures to help you invest in those, in that, in that, in those infrastructure and, and, and wells that you were talking about. But most of those wells are now owned by Nigerians and Nigerian companies. They can't even service it. I mean, Correct. you saw what happened to the Christmas tree. The wells are moribund. So who will bring in that big capital injection? That's what I ask. So the people who will bring that, um, so when you look at, when you're looking at an investment framework, you just don't look at independent micro businesses. You look at the macro picture. The macro picture, if the environment is stable, you have rule of law, you have sanctity of contracts, you have general security, you have crude theft being addressed so that you'd lower the carbon intensity of your oil operations, capital flows to those sectors, whether you're independents or whether you're IOCs. You, we, we have to do what is within our control. Energy prices have gone up, people are, you know, other oil producers, I cited the example of, um, of Australia, Yes, the energy transition is accelerating, but the, prime, the energy sources of today are the ones who are driving the economies of those countries. Saudi Aramco isn't, um, is deal, is, you know, able, was able to earn $42 billion in profits um, in Q2 alone. Um, Australia has less than 40% of our gas reserves. They've been able to earn, they're on track to earn $56 billion in, uh, in revenue from LNG sales. We can do those things here if we address the macro But we've not done those things in over 40 years because these are the problems since the 70s in this country. So what are the assurances that you're going to, some we've not done over 40 to 50 years. What are the assurances that you're going to get them done in eight years? What is your plan? Well, there, so the, those are the, so the, you have to send the right signals immediately. And the right signals around oil and gas is really an enforcement of your security infrastructure and architecture. That sends the right signals to investors that we have a serious business, uh, we have a serious administration in place. The right signal to send around um, gas production is the right commercial cost reflective tariffs. So when you address security, then you need to address the source of cash flow for those businesses. When you deregulate and liberalize that sector, you also you, you, you boost your confidence from, from the investor community. When you address all the other, th all the other regulatory barriers um, that drive costs and extend your project timelines, you boost confidence. Those are the first things you need to do to signal to the investment community that you're serious and we're open for business, that we're changing direction. Okay, I'm sure both of you are aware that this uh, APC manifesto has been severely criticized by the opposition. 
and other concerned stakeholders. You may say coming from the opposition, what do you expect them to say uh, anyway? But they've complained about certain omissions in the document. One, that the document does not really offer any concrete ideas about how to deal with crude oil theft, mm -hmm. which is a major issue. Second, the oil and gas sector that you have been talking about, Olu, they also say that, look, the uh, document just says, we will encourage the oil companies to give more assistance to the host communities. Mm -hmm. Okay? Some of the critics say, no, that's not the way to go about it. It's not throwing money at it, giving money to the host communities. What are those concrete ideas about what you do with those host communities that we have seen suffering from oil spills, from damages, you know, uh, for, from a dilapidated... Uh, uh, infrastructure. The third major criticism is that it is a copy and paste manifesto. The fourth criticism is that uh, it lacks depth, particularly with regard to uh, concrete, uh, you know, ideas, and it pays no attention whatsoever to the big issue of corruption. Those who have, uh, you know, done an extra of the document say, why is it that this document is not talking about corruption? I don't know who wants to address some of those criticisms, you know, beyond partisanship. Pepe, you, know, you want to start? Uh, maybe you can deal with the oil and gas theft yes. and then I'll address some of the issues maybe on security. Yes, correct. Um, for the oil and gas theft, um, the framework to address that is in place. Um, and so let's take the host community um, uh, fund that you mentioned. That is already, and the details around that are already outlined in the PIA. Um, we are moving into the implementation phase of the PIA, and there will be consultative engagements with the business community and the various stakeholders, including the communities, on how to ensure that that host community fund delivers a few things. First thing, the much needed development in um, those communities. The second is to restore the environment in those communities to um, the, you know, address the environmental degradation that has ha occurred in those communities. And the third piece of it is making sure that they have a sense, that the communities have a sense of ownership, that they are incentivized to protect the national assets that are within their communities. The details of that will be worked out in the implementation of the PIA. So maybe, you know, it's, it, we would, you would probably be accused of copying and pasting the PIA if you had to put all of those details as well in the, in the manifesto. But that is the, that is the vehicle for which a lot of the details and will be implemented under the PIA and the host community fund. With crude theft, it is just um, an issue era of, you know, how do you, it's a wider issue which also addresses corruption, which is how do you improve the rule of law? restore confidence in the rule of law, restore confidence in contract sanctity. And by doing that, you make sure that you have a leader who has the political will to take on vested interests and enforce the structure that we have in place to address insecurity and to address crude theft. Um, it's political will. Most of the ideas, most of the things that we need to do are there. It is the enforcement, the will to enforce. And I think that's what differentiates this particular, will differentiate this particular administration. Thank you very much, Olu. Um, doctor, you mentioned um, that the opposition has been um, criticizing the document. It, it is their job to criticize the manifesto. But um, I think what the incoming administration is looking forward to is constructive criticism. It's very important. And um, on the incoming administration. Yes, incoming we haven't had the election yet. By the grace of God, incoming administration. But, the election but, is still next year. <laughs> but let me say this. Um, the problems, when people talk about the debt, I think you realize it's an 80-page document, and there's only so much debt you can put inside. But I believe on Tuesday, during the town hall, Asiwaju Tinubu and Shatima gave some analysis and some in-depth figures as to how they plan to address issues on the economy and issues on insecurity. Um, issues of insecurity are not far-fetched. A weak economy will always lead to some level of insecurity. Um, one of the greatest challenges Nigeria has is inadequate jobs for our teaming youth, sustainable jobs and gainful employment for our teaming youth. 
And um, there's an adage my mom always said to me as a young man, which is, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. We need to create employment. We need to get our young and very active youths positively engaged. Now, in the absence of that, they will be, they, they, they tend to channel that energy and that innovation into negative aspects. But when an economy is robust and is working and growing, there will be positive deployment of those resources. Now, obviously, when it comes to security, there are some elements that have crossed the Rubicon and have gone far and may not be able to reverse back. And I see what you, Tinobu, said on Tuesday, that they will engage, the administration will engage with them frontally. And what is engagement? It's three things. And he spoke about them. People, skills, equipment. The military would be recruiting and engaging to bulk up our human resources. He spoke about equipment. Would there be deployment of tactical gear, better surveillance and ground surveillance, better communications equipment to identify, monitor, and track? And skills, there will be human capital de deploy, um, development. And our resources will be deployed to the field to engage with and resolve the issues of insecurity. As he said, there will be a full engagement to ensure that this issue is resolved, insecurity, or there is a surrender or utter if, um, devastation to the insurgents. I mean, no, you, no, you have not addressed the issue about the omission with regard to corruption, which is a major point of criticism. Who is going to address that? So, she she yeah. did. I, I, I okay. did. I did. Yeah, when you were talking about crude oil theft. No, no, I did. I said the general environment, a macro picture where you have a you know, a functioning independent judiciary where you have sanctity of contracts, that tends to reduce corruption. So the, we've talked about different forms of rent seeking. If you have a wider environment where you have, where, where the, the biggest, you know, as, as we said, the biggest issues around, if you're able to restore confidence in the judicial sector and the rule of law, in, um, in contract sanctity, you reduce corruption. If there, if there are consequences, as um, Ashwajo outlined on Tuesday, if, you, if there's confidence that if you are, um, that will first provide a broad-based economic growth that is able to, that not only, is, when, when we talk about that, he talked about double-digit growth, a minimum of 6%, and that is intentional. It has to exceed our population growth rate of 3%. Mm -hmm. When you do that, and as Asuko has just mentioned, you create an environment where people are actually productively employed in a positive way, and then you have the wider framework of sanctity of contracts, rule of law, there is less corruption, but there is no absence of corruption, as you very, very well know, well, in, very, okay. in any other climate. Well, it's a textbook idea. <laughs> we'll uh, so, so a lot of it, the practicality of it, is flat on its, its face. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an instance. You were talking about signaling the economy. Correct. It doesn't work, and I'll prove it to you. Okay. You see, after 20 years we signed the PNID, where are the investors in the IOC? Isn't removal of subsidies supposed to be part of the PNID? Why has this administration, an APC administration, stalled on it? So it's just still the things that work for you and the cherry picking that goes on. And that's why I deliberately asked the question about who will service those moribund you know, facilities in this sector? He said once we signal, the investment will come. We've not been able to do it in a while. In over 15 years, we've battled Boko Haram, albeit a general that your party sold to us in 2015, said it was going to solve the... He's not been able to solve the problem. So the question is, what differently are you going to do on ground? You talked about the sanctity of contract. You saw how the PNID was, was, div uh, was denigrated recently when the, there was a disc back and forth between the presidency and NUPRC as regards, you know, giving an all clear on, on a particular deal, or a deal. We saw all that. So what would you do differently? You talk about political will. <laughs> a lot of people say, how will that happen overnight? So I think you mean the, PI, PI, the PIA. PIA. Yeah, correct. PIA. Yeah, PIA. Yes, PIA. Uh, sorry, okay. PIA. Okay. Uh, Petroleum Industry Act. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm here to talk about what, will, what, you know, what Ashiwaju will do, not the current administration. And I think 
Um, so you're dissociating yourself no, from the no, current No, I'm not dissociating myself. I'm here you're to You're not part of the record. So we, 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 the conversation today, and I think I heard your previous segment, which was that we weren't going to engage in political rhetoric and we were going to focus issues. on the substance of the issues. And that's what we're here to do. And on the substance of the issues, um, you have to look at people's track records. And the can this particular candidate has a track record of delivering. You may disagree with his, uh, with many other things or many other people, but these particular candidates, um, 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 Ashiwaju Tinubu and um, Governor, um, His Excellency Governor Shatima, have a track record of delivering on these things. And if they, and What's it is important, record? the track record is if you look at Lagos State today, where you said you have the ability. To, I mean, this is the biggest, one of the biggest economies on the subcontinent. Yes. And so I even though it is a subnational. So there is track record here. Nobody is, um, no, you know, and nobody is disclaiming the fact that this would be a challenge. Um, and it is not an easy job to turn around well, an economy this big. Um, but the point that we were discussing, the, the point that is really, imp that what is really important, um, you were talking about federal, um, federal um, rates in the U.S. earlier in your segment. That is a signaling. We were talking about when you set certain inflationary targets, what you do on policy making is signaling to investment communities and, the peop and people take positions based on your signals as a government. That's what you're supposed to do. But it's not worked in the U.S. You can it's, see the Fed rates are not, the US. Where they is not it reduced not inflation. You can so see. So the, it's not every time signaling the, even, so, even works so, in the U.S. So, it, so, if, so interest rate is one aspect of it. But we, you listened to, I listened to your earlier segment where they were talking about the fact that, yes, the depth of the recession may be different. So you, we're talking about how to make sure that 90 million Nigerians um, who currently live in poverty are lifted out of that poverty so that when you make policy decisions that have certain adverse impacts, it is not completely critical and destroying and is, we're not as volatile as of an economy. That's what the focus of the future is. Um, we, we welcome ideas, and we, but we also wex, welcome execution capacity. Um, what we're saying is that you send the right signals, you demonstrate that you have the execution capacity, and that is what Ashiwaju has demonstrated in Lagos State. Um, that's what Ash, um, the Governor Shetima has demonstrated around insecurity in Borneo State. Um, I encourage you to listen to the content of what they have to say and review their own track record and make your judgment about whether or not they have the capacity okay. to deliver on, on their promises. Ulu and Asukwa would like to thank you very much. I'm sure this won't be the last moment when we'll be discussing this. We still have quite a number of uh, months uh, leading up to the election. Yes, and there will be another opportunity to further interrogate the manifesto you of your much. party and your candidate and also of also uh, other parties. Thank you very much for Thank this you opportunity. Thank you very, very much.